Welcome to Black Revolutionary Theater Workshops, October Melanated Mondays. This month's theme is the Great White Roast. And let's be real, who's had it coming for 400 years? If you're not already familiar with Black Revolutionary Theater Workshop, BRTW exists to disrupt any and all oppressive systems as they impact Black people. We use narrative and performance as a vehicle to engage our audiences in the aspects of civic engagement that are accessible to all of us. And we connect those with performance to lift up those various opportunities, put y'all in touch with the organizers, educators, journalists, the movers and shakers who are out there doing the thing, letting you know about who to support, who to follow, whose action items to look up. So with no further ado, it is my distinct pleasure to open us up with our performances this evening. We have pieces by two BRTW producers, myself and Mia Kogavia. And, you know, it always does our hearts some good to have a piece in here from someone from Revolution Now. Uh, Revolution Now alum A. Emmanuel Leiden has a piece that rounds out the end of our performances this evening. And for any Black writers, wherever you are in your process, whether you've been produced, whether you've been published, whether you're just sitting on a fat notebook of genius that, you know, you're afraid to share with the world, Revolution Now has extended applications through to Friday, October 29th at 11.59 p.m. Eastern. I'm going to tell y'all a secret. We black and we run on CP time. So if you send in your application at 1 a.m., we're going to read it. Don't, 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 don't run with that shit, though. I don't want to see no applications on Halloween. I said... <laughs> <laughs> 10, 29, 21, 11, 59 p.m. You get a little bit of a leeway. Don't, don't act up. But we do want to encourage as many Black writers as possible to apply to this program. All applicants get the support of BRTW producers, dramaturgs, directors as they're developing their original work. We are happy and proud to present the productions of your original work as audio dramas on Black revolutionary media, the podcast that is on all of the podcatchers your Amazons, your Apples, your Googles, all the corporations that need to go down so that we can save our environment. Um, the other thing is, of course, we pay all of the writers involved in this process. They all get paid $250 while you're essentially learning how to get your stuff produced. As a part of the process of getting your work to a professional level, you're also going to write treatments, you're going to synopsize, you're going to come out of this with all of the things that you have to hand to producers, managers, and agents to get your career going. And that honestly, I think is the real gift of the program. Aside from that, you also don't have to worry about finding producers. You're not gonna be out here fundraising. We take care of the grant writing. We have an in-house audio producer, Ranchia, who's a gift. Uh, we also have an ensemble, many of whom you've seen on Melanated Monday, some of whom you may have seen live back in the before times. Y'all remember that? Um, and new Black artists that we're encountering every day. One of the best ways that Black actors can work with us and still get paid that $20 per hour, by the way, is by recording on the podcast. So that is an opportunity for writers. Y'all have until 10 October 29th, 1159 Eastern. Give or take a few hours, but don't, don't act up. I will say words to you from my email. That's one of the benefits of being one of the co-producers. I won't get fired for being like, you must be right out the left side of your mind rolling up in my applications like this. Um, I think those are all of the introductions before we get started. The first piece is by some person named H. Harvey. It's called Public Service Announcement. I am so thrilled to have Tim Craig reading Tad, Mia Kogavia reading I May, and Donnell Cole Price reading Stage Directions. And with that, I'm going to turn it over to our wonderful ensemble. Waterfront condos. Private beaches. Private islands. Ooh, snorkeling adventures. Sushi by the water. Anything by the water, even. <gasps> they look at each other. Handcrafted hand mayonnaise. mayonnaise. This and more white people nonsense is in danger. That's right, Tad. There's a looming catastrophe, and this time it'll affect us. Everyday, normal, middle class white Americans. Just, just like, like you. you. Raising water levels. 
shrinking natural wonders. And frozen human waste covering the trails up Everest. Fucking Everest. What the actual fuck? Ted! Ted! You Ted! animals! You're scaring America! I'm just... My Sherpa had to shovel the ice shit out of the way, and I... It's okay. Tell them. My iPhone died while I was taking a selfie. <gasps> And I just found the perfect angle without getting him in it. Or all the piles of human Human shit shit that's- Yeah. Do you see how climate change is affecting the life of this little middle-class white man? Climate change. This could be you. I am you, America, some of you. But anyway, you're America too. Uh, I mean, yes. Tell them what happened. I can't. You can. Okay. One of my 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 favorite summer houses is like somewhere on a coast, and there was a hurricane and a lot of flooding and Todd, like I can't even. You can do it. You're a strong, independently wealthy. Hashtag girl boss, and you can't even. A lot of people had like wet floors and they wanted to get in my house because it had like dry floors, but my house staff wouldn't let them in. And so the people talked about it on Twitter and it went viral. There, there. What did they do? They photoshopped my face onto a hurricane. <laughs> Look at it, America. Look at what climate change did to her. This could be you. I am. <laughs> so next November. And during whatever elections happened before that. Vote for whoever will protect you from climate change. You may have to vote for higher taxes. You may even have to vote. Dun, dun, dun. Blue. Blue. But that man or woman. Probably a man. Can literally save the world and save you. Yes, you, America, from selfie failing on a mountain surrounded by smaller mountains of frozen human waste. Or ugly crying yourself to sleep while watching your face photoshopped into a natural disaster. So do it for yourselves, America. Or one day, that condo you're planning to leave to your son will be a diving attraction. End. Thank you so much to my marvelous cast, Miyako Gavia and Tim Craig and Donnell Cole Price. The next piece up. Uh, Those of y'all who've been listening to the podcast, shout out to that thing that we're supposed to market that we constantly forget to market and a special shout out to all of y'all who've been downloading anyway. Like, what are y'all like following secrets in the ether? Bless y'all. Murder He Tote by Miyako Gavia. We have Miyako Gavia reading Charlie and Renee slash faux man or faux woman. And we have Tim Craig reading faux man. And Donnell Cole Price reading stage directions and commercial guy. Scene, a film set made to look like a library. Violence, homicide, burglary, murder. These are all things that we rightfully fear and why we regularly rely on law enforcement to protect us. But what happens when they don't come in time? What happens when you're alone and scared and are forced to defend yourself with only your wits and intuition? Hi, I'm Charlie Bergman and this is Murder He Tote, Deadly Baggage. Tonight's story, 25 year old Renee Miller recounts her harrowing encounter. Lights slowly up on a poorly skilled reenactor with a bad blonde wig. She wears oversized glasses and carrying an NPR tote bag. The faux Renee follows along 
pantomime and what real Renee says. It was a pretty hot day in July and I was walking home from brunch. My friends asked if I wanted to catch a cab with them, but I lived in Williamsburg and they lived in the West Village. So I told them it didn't really make sense. I should have listened to them. I should have listened to myself. I was almost home when it started raining pretty heavy. So I ran the last few blocks to my apartment and went inside to dry off. There was this man in the doorway. Faux man enters. He was um, uh, darker complected, you know, like black. And he didn't look familiar and he didn't look like he had anywhere to be. And I was just really nervous. So I went upstairs to my apartment and looked out my window and there he was just standing there. It was kind of hard to see him because it was still raining out, but I sat there and watched him for like 15 minutes and my heart was pounding, you know? So I got up my courage and I went downstairs. Um, excuse me, are you waiting for someone? Me? Oh, I'm just waiting for the bus. Well, the bus stop is over there, so. Yeah, but it's raining. The stoop is not a bus stop. It's not much uh, protection from the rain. But it's not a bus stop. It's private property. My apartment is not an umbrella. Well, until the rain clears up, I'm not, I'm not leaving. Faux actors freeze. We'll return with a thrilling conclusion after this commercial break. Hey, you. Yes, you. The scared person sitting in the dark on the cat on your couch. Are you sure you locked your door? Are you sure? There could be a burglar sneaking in through your back door or climbing through your window to strangle your dog right this second. Quick, go check. Did you check? Well, you wouldn't need to if you had a Youngstown home brand home security system. The Youngstown system employed state of the art audio video, K9, GPS, DNA, and inferred technology to keep your family safe and secure. Everything that happens around your home will be tracked via your simple phone app and can be viewed with a push of a button. Watch your children come home from school, watch the underpaid delivery man drop kick your package onto your stoop, watch your partner bring their lover over to your house. What's more? The Youngstown brand home security system will also call the police for you when it detects possible criminal activity within your neighborhood. Those strange foreign kids from down the block won't dare rob your lawn gnomes or steal your jobs. Not on our watch. What are you waiting for? Go to www.ytsecurity.com and use the code MURDERTOTE to get 15% off your installation costs. Buy it today before they kidnapped your baby tonight. Welcome back to Murder He Tote, Deadly Baggage. When we last left Renee Miller, she was in a fight for her life against a mysterious intruder. My apartment is not an umbrella. Well, until the rain lets up, I'm, I'm not leaving. I had never been so scared in my life. I didn't know what to do. So I pulled out my phone to call the police and then the black man pulled out his phone and started recording me and calling me racist. And I was so scared that I maybe kind of sort of raised my voice to the police. Listen, you motherfuckers. This Negro is on my porch looking shifty as fuck and I want him off my property right fucking now. Yeah, I'm gonna go. Wait, what are you doing? Hailing a cab. You can't get a cab. Uh, you're calling the police. I'd rather not get shot. So guess what? I'm leaving. He turns his back and puts, on his, puts out his hand for a cab. At that mo point, my fear ratcheted, like really ramped up. I couldn't let him get away. I mean, I couldn't get away from him. He had his hand raised. I didn't know if he was going to hit me, so I did the only thing I could. 
faux Renee waxed a man over her head, over his head with her tote bag. I hit him with my tote. Oh shit. She looks around panicking, then drags faux man off stage. So anyway, when the police found his body a week later, they concluded that the tote bag taped to his hand was his and could have been used to attack me. It was so heavy, it could have been used to crush my skull if I hadn't crushed his first. I saved my own life with luck and intuition. The police failed me. I don't know what could have happened if I wasn't so quick. There are still nights when I wake up in a cold sweat, dreaming of NPR tote bags and an attacker who winds up at the bottom of the Hudson. But I have Instagram and my friends and brunch, and that makes me grateful for every day. It makes me grateful I survived. Thank you for joining us tonight on Murder He Tote, Deadly Baggage. Stay tuned for the season premiere of Law and Order UFO. Until next time, crime fans, sweet dreams. End of play. Thank you to our marvelous actors, Tim Craig, Mia Kogavia, and Donnell Cole Price. And another thank you to Mia Kogavia for her amazing writing. Uh, Murder He Tote, again, is an episode that you can access on Black Revolutionary Media, which is on all of the podcatchers. Uh, the next piece and final piece of the evening is called 10 Arguments. It's by a Black Revolutionary or a Revolution Now alum, A. Emanuel Leiden. A. Emanuel Leiden's work, Cave Canem, is also on Black Revolutionary Media. It is a two-part uh, two episode. Both episodes are already out, so you can, I don't know if it counts as binging, if there are only two, but I'm gonna call it binging. Uh, you can binge those now. 10 Arguments by A. Emanuel Leiden, uh, featuring Mia Kogavia as Izzy, Donnell Cole Price as Stan, and Tim Craig as Joe. Joe leads Izzy into her new office. Welcome to AT&T's digital marketing family, Izzy. Thanks, sir. Please call me Joe, and here is your layer. Why don't you take some time to settle in? Our IT guy, David, was here this morning. He got everything running smoothly. I'll just leave it to you. All right. Joe exits. Izzy places photo frames, pencil holders, etc., on her desk. She hangs her Harvard degree. Stan creepily pokes his head in, watching, maybe glaring. Izzy sees him and starts. Hey, didn't mean to frighten you there. Oh, no, it's fine. Just wanted to introduce myself. I'm Stan, next door, in the room slightly less spacious than this one. <laughs> we'll be working very closely together. Oh my God, I'm so happy to be here. Stan is wandering about surveying the room. I bet, I bet. So you're Izzy, the rambunctious rock star everyone's been murmuring about. I mean, were you at another department? No. Oh, what were you before? Google last year. AT&T offered more, so here I am. Significant less spacious. Sorry? Uh, where did you get your master's? Master's is a little bit down the road. This isn't a master's? I haven't even looked into it. Where do you recommend? You said you were at Google. Yeah, best internship I ever did. Stan kicks the desk. It's an impulsive somatic response to the scalding fury inside. Oh my God, are you bleeding? No, not at all. That didn't hurt? No, that toenail was already split in half. Well, I'll see you at the meeting. Yeah, nice meeting you. Stan limps out. Izzy resumes inhabiting the room, places a crucifix or another Christian knickknack. She puts on gospel music at a soft volume, hums along. Stan returns. Hey. Hey. So you're still decorating. Um, yeah. Atmosphere is important. Please don't think I mean anything. Just letting you know. 
just looking out, the pace is pretty fast here. Well, I don't have a task. Right. Job security is pretty good, though. Nothing to worry about. Great raises, great benefits. They really take care of us. Business trips are slowed down, but there's so much fun. The travel is really nice, is a really nice perk. They'll probably be sending us out sooner than later. We got rid of mosque. Sorry, mass way back into May. No new cases. Yep, been here 20 years. Wow, 20. That's uh, <laughs> almost 30. <laughs> <Bitter. I'm firm. laughs> Account manager is 23. Is that all? <laughs> Shouldn't you be somewhere curing cancer? <laughs> What's your story? Honestly, I think I did some of my best work in high school. I helped put together an Instagram campaign for... Stan knocks the religious knickknack to the ground. I saw you. You did that on purpose. Oh, you mean this? He throws something else to the floor. Oops. Flailing arms about wrecking stuff. Oops. 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 She pushes him away from her desk, throws her coffee in his face. He screams and flees. Joe bursts in. Well, is everything okay here? I, I thought I heard something. Stan was trying to break all my stuff. Hmm. I was afraid that might happen. He does this with every new person? Oh, no. He just gets a little territorial sometimes. I see it's truly bothering you. Uh, so I'll, I'll call David. The IT guy? Yes, he'll get everything running smoothly. Um, okay. Joe leaves. Izzy tries to decorate again. Stan returns carrying a donut with a candle in it. Just had a little talk with Davey Wavy and I'm here to, to present, I'm, I'm here to, to present a peace offering. Even though you're the one who gave me a second degree burn, snitch, don't want to get off on the wrong foot. Neither do I. Here. Thanks. I really appreciate it, Sam. The donut blows up. Izzy extracts a Nerf gun from her desk and opens rapid fire on Stan. This is my office, mine. I waited for it, I bust my ass for it, and I did all the work for the last guy. I worked too, pal. They made a promise. Stan produces more bombs. Izzy keeps shooting. Joe stands outside the office. Fight, 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 world star, world star. End of scene. Thank you to our amazing cast, Mia Kogavia, Tim Craig, and Donnell Cole Price. And thank you to A. Emanuel Leiden, who wrote this wonderful piece. Now we're gonna transition towards our community conversation with Amber Walker of the People's Report podcast. But before we do, we do have a handful of updates, housekeeping kind of things. And like always, I solemnly swear to forget at least one majorly important thing. And Tim Craig or Mia Kogavi, I'm sure will correct me. Uh, so supporting BRTW in the season of announcing that we have programming and that you know we pay black artists, money does not grow on trees, especially in black neighborhoods. So please, if you have the resources, support us. Part of the way that we live our mission is by making sure that all of our programming is available to as many people as possible for free. That doesn't mean that we get to do it without shelling out any ducats on our end. So if you can, please donate on our website, thebrtw.org. We have links for PayPal. We have links for Fractured Atlas for folks who don't want their money to go through PayPal or for folks who want to make sure that they can get a, um, oh, the tax write-off thing for, you know, if you donate enough money to get that, which most of us don't. But shout out to you if you can. And if you happen to be on your phone while you're watching this, why don't you just open up Venmo, go to at the BRTW and send your favorite black ensemble $25 or more. 
heavy emphasis on or more. Um, but in all seriousness, please do support us if you have the ability to do so. That said, we definitely recognize that we exist by and for a community that oftentimes is drastically underserved. It's totally understandable if you cannot. There are completely free ways to support us. One of the free ways to support us is doing exactly what you're doing right now, which is watching this. And hey, liking, subscribing, all of that goes a long way. Hitting follow if you're on the social medias. We are on Facebook at Black Revolutionary Theater Workshop because we couldn't think of a longer title. We're also on Twitter and Instagram at the BRTW. Um, like I mentioned, we're on Venmo at the BRTW. And you can also find us on all the podcasters, Black Revolutionary Media, and our website, thebrtw.org. Tim, Miyako, what have I forgotten this time? Uh, we also have Patreon, oh, patreon.com slash the BRTW. We have all sorts of little goodies. Uh, we have a specialty podcast on there. You'll get behind the scenes updates. Uh, we take these Melanated Mondays down after a certain amount of time and you can get access to them forever if you join the Patreon. So you can listen to all of the Melanated Mondays we've had since we started recording them. And we'll have new goodies uh, depending on how many more people sign up. So if more people sign up, you could maybe get a murder tote or something fun like that. I love it. I love it. So with that, let's move on to our community conversation. Amber Walker is a journalist, activist, and co-host of the phenomenal podcast, The People's Report. Amber is also a digital media strategist and founder of We Made Media, LLC. Amber, would you like to continue introducing yourself? Sure. Thanks for having me, y'all. Um, I mean, that pretty much covers it. <laughs> um, besides that, you know, I um, freelance write for a publication called The Grade, which um, covers the um, idea of like education journalism and um, critiques the, the media industry in that respect. But that's pretty much all I have going on. And I'm, uh, I do stand up comedy every once in a while here in Los Angeles, where I'm currently based. Word. Thank you for that. And if y'all are in LA, get your lives together and go see Amber performing stand-up comedy live. Yes. Let's get into on Wednesday at Ken in Long Beach. So here in South LA, come down this way. Ken in Long Beach? Yes. At what time? It is at 7.30. All right. Y'all know what y'all doing. BRTW LA crew, 7.30 Wednesday. Yes. All right, let's get into this conversation. This is for everyone. Uh, when you think about the great white roast, what comes to mind? What did you expect to see reflected in a lineup of works by Black artists? Um, when I think of the great white roast, I think of just white people getting a tenth of what's coming to them. <laughs> because, I mean, honestly, y'all deserve so much more. Um, but just having fun with the concept of whiteness and with the, the stereotypes and turning them on their heads and just having fun with it. That's what I think of when I think of the great white roast. And when I wanna see this kind of stuff in the lineup of work by black artists, I wanna see people go all out. I want to see people pull no punches. I want to. I want it to be funny, um, and I don't care if it hurts white feelings. Yeah, because all of this stuff is true anyway. You know, it's like holding up a mirror to um, you know white society, white supremacy, patriarchy, and saying like this is the you know type of punishment you inflict on the rest of the world. Um, how about you get a taste of it so you know. It, what it feels like for the rest of us. Word. Any thoughts, Tim and Donnell? It's just kind of like the elephant in the room. Let's go ahead and just bring it up. Let's get a little laugh in while you're at it. Big old elephant. <laughs> so the next part of this question is, how has art been a medium to both stay critical and laugh? as Black creatives? I think 
our art has been a medium to laugh as long as there's been like storytelling. Um, I think back to all of the the folk tales that I read growing up, uh, particularly African American folk tales, um, with like Br'er Rabbit, and just how he outwits everyone who's trying to like eat him or get the better of him um and how that contains humor and you know it's really a, a story of it's a story of survival and not just surviving but like thriving and having fun with it and existing and i think that we really need laughter in order to survive and laughter is a is a really great way of like pointing out points in society and making it go down a little bit easier than if it were just told with a straight face. Um, and I think that a very important thing about it is like who this laughter is directed at. Like it needs to punch up instead of like punching down because otherwise it just like, it's just not, it's just cruelty. So if you're, if you're telling stories and laughing in order to survive, like tell stories and laugh about, about things that are bringing you as a group down, so. Yeah, I love that point that you made, especially about um, punching up instead of punching down, because one of the, I think one of the, the most powerful aspects of the arts in terms of being able to stay critical, but also elicit whatever your intended catharsis may be, whether it's like laughter from comedy, crying from tragedy, et cetera, is art isn't just about product and about this emotional experience. It's also about craft. There is, you know, technique. There are all these things that go into it. And while satire is often comedic, satire isn't necessarily comedic and being able to kind of create an ethos of operations is an aspect of craft that I think a lot of us forget about. And so whether it's the simple rule of don't punch down and also knowing why you don't punch down and getting a sense of what your relationship is to privilege and knowing that like the punch up versus punch down mechanism is not the same thing as saying, I can't talk about something, just thinking about how you relate and what power you bring to that conversation. All right, so let's, oh, Tim, go ahead. I was just gonna uh, reiterate uh, a little bit of the, what you were touching on, Heather, uh, is the power of satire um, and how you, you mentioned that it is not always comedic, um, but it is able to kind of cut through and give us a perspective using that levity and using that bubble that we all have. Um, and to gain a perspective, because I think like tonight, you know, we're satirizing whiteness um, but I think in so many cultures and society, we operate and live in it in, in you know, different aspects and corners of our life. So sometimes the satire helps us gain, a, a, I would argue, and I would definitely say a healthier perspective on uh, you know, what is actually being built and what is being created. So we're actually able to, like, like uh, Amber said, hold a mirror up and try to gain some, uh, some reflection um, for uh, a, a uni um, that is more important. Um, and so it's, it's powerful in that way, just to kind of reiterate on some of the things that you were touching. Thank you. Thank you. I want to turn the focus directly on our guest speaker this evening. Obviously, Miyako, Tim, Donnell, if y'all have additional thoughts, feel free to uh, chime in. But we have some questions just to celebrate, Amber. Um, <laughs> first, can you tell us the origin story about the People's Report and what was the moment that you and your co-host, co Reed Clark, decided that this project absolutely needed to happen? Sure. So um, the idea for the podcast came about, um, I was on the train actually in New York. <laughs> and this was like early in my days of like trying to, you know, start writing stand up. Um, because I'd gone on stage a couple of times. I'm like, I don't know if this is for me. So let me think about a medium where I can like control you know, the product and like get some experience writing. So, um, you know, that was kind of just what I, 
an idea that I had in my mind. Fast forward to um, quarantine, <laughs> you know, um, so early, late spring, early summer, you know, Reed and I were in a relationship. So we were just like at home um, thinking about like what we could do to keep sharp. So, you know, I had gone from like my bed to my kitchen table to my kitchen. And that was like pretty much my universe for several months. And I didn't have like any other outlets. And, you know, um, with comedy, um, there weren't any performance venues um, open in DC where we were living at the time. So just thinking about like, what can we do like to bond as a couple to kind of um, break up the monotony of the day to day during quarantine. And also, you know, um, kind of stretch our creative muscles and work together. So um, that's how the podcast was born. And we had actually like recorded a few segments like um, before the pandemic, but you know, with competing schedules, I had started a new job, finished grad school. Um, we hadn't gotten it off the ground until quarantine really forced us to like sit down and create it and like actually put an episode out there. So it was really just a response to um, just trying to figure out like what we could do together in order to like further our comedic voices, but also um, as a response to um, just like everything that was going on in the world at the time, you know, with uh, the Trump presidency and like all of the madness that was happening with um, COVID and watching the government's response to it, especially um, how it affected, you know, poor communities, communities of color, just like as a means to kind of shout to the power structure that like this stuff is important and it's like, it's so ridiculous that it's like comedic to a certain extent. So the idea of like laughing at the headlines to keep from crying, which is like a, a concept that I borrow from um, my professor, um, Justin Emeka, who told me that like way back in undergrad, like sometimes like the black experience means like you have to, you know, just take a look at things that are happening that are affecting us that are tragic, but you have to, um, like find the, the humor in it in order to keep moving forward. So that's um, how the People's Report was born. Love that. It also brings to mind that great Charlie Chaplin quote, uh, is it humor is tragedy and long view? This idea that's like, you just switch the, the lens on tragedy and suddenly that new perspective gives you so much opportunity for humor. Um, thinking about your journey as a writer, We'd love to just know more about what that journey has been, specifically as a satire writer. And if you have a satirical writing process that you would feel comfortable sharing with folks. Oh, sure. Um, so my writing started off as um, in the journalistic space. And um, as a reporter, there's not very much like creativity or humor that I can infuse <laughs> into my work. You know, it's pretty much like by the book. So um, I started to perform stand-up comedy like on the like eve of my 30th birthday. So it's like, I think I was having like kind of like a, you know, a third life crisis or something like that. Like just wanting to um, like do something that was like creative and fun and just forced me to step outside of like my every day of, you know, like going to work, kind of dealing with like all of the nonsense that was happening in um, like the political space, the, the news space, but not really having a space to like speak about it. So the stage, you know, performing became the space. Um, and like, as I mentioned before, um, I'm not exactly the best <laughs> like stand-up comic. It's not really a medium that um, resonates so well with me, but I love writing. So um, the podcast was a way to um, kind of explore these topics that I was like rolling around in my head um, in terms of the news that I couldn't necessarily like write in the pages of a newspaper. So it's like, how can I express, you know, because I felt like when I became a journalist, to, a, large, to a, a certain extent, my voice was like taken away from me. So the podcast is kind of like a medium to get my, to give my voice back. Because, you know, as a journalist, you're trained, you have to be objective. Like you can't um, infuse your personal opinion into your work um, or you're at the risk of, you know, like prejudicing the audience. But we can't, I think it's starting to be more accepted today that like journalists have a life outside of the newsroom. Um, they have opinions outside of the newsroom and that it's still possible to produce, um, you know, objective content without, you know, divorcing yourself completely from like your, you know, political social beliefs. So um, the podcast was a way for me to, and I don't, you know, claim the podcast is news. Like it's like, we talk about things that are like current events, but it's not news. So um, we just use that as a space to kind of, like I said, hold a mirror up to society to say like, this is really what we're doing. This is America. Yes, this is America. So, you know, think about this, laugh at it, but also like, how are we gonna move beyond it? What's, what action is gonna occur from it? Like, I love, my favorite part about the podcast is um, 
when people like send me a message, um, like, oh, this topic was so like interesting. It made me think about X, Y, Z. So as long as we're getting people to think about, you know, think critically about what's happening in the world around us, I think we're doing our job as creatives. There's, there's so much I want to dig into there and I need to respect everyone's time. Um, but I do love that you talk about your relationship to your voice in journalism as a creative in comedy. And that kind of begs the question as a journalist, do you consider your, your journalistic work, that particular craft as an artistic practice? Not really. <laughs> uh, unfortunately, cause like when I became a journalist, um, I did it more so for the love of writing. And it made sense like in terms of the direction my career was going in at the time, I had been um, a teacher and I ended up covering education um, at the newspaper I was working at in um, Wisconsin. So it just made kind of sense um, in the terms of a linear track to move into like writing about education journalism. And I would say like, I did have some, I wouldn't necessarily call it creative freedom, but just like professional freedom to like cover stories that I thought like had merit in the community. like if it wasn't like a kind of like a daily beat, like, you know, something like the schools are shutting down because of weather, like that's one type of story, but like covering like what was going on with students in classrooms, more so like special interest, human interest type pieces. Um, so I wouldn't necessarily say that um, it was a creative um, endeavor, but more so I saw it as kind of a social justice endeavor. Like, um, and I got a lot of uh, pushback, surprisingly, well, I guess not surprisingly from the community about this, but I guess like my predecessors didn't write as much about like, you know, race, class, um, gender issues in the schools. But I'm like, you know, my perspective was if there are, if the school district is majority students of color, then the majority of like human interest stories I'm gonna cover are gonna speak to these students because they're the majority. Um, but, you know, I was sometimes accused of being, you know, like a race baiter, <laughs> which was like, this doesn't make any sense. But, um, you know, I didn't really feel like I had a leg to stand on in terms of like responding to like that type of criticism personally, because I didn't want to, you know, like prejudice the community's mind against the newsroom. So, but I would say that not necessarily like an artistic endeavor, but more so, um, you know, social justice and bringing the attention of what these students were going through in the district to like the masses. And it, like the conversations that it did create, you know, were um, necessary and telling of, you know, the type of community that, you know, the school, the students had to grow up in. Yeah, you've, you've already touched on so many aspects of kind of the, the, the weeds of journalism, like the, the, whether or not it's a, an artistic endeavor or, you know, like a creative practice, um, the relationship to um, objectivity, um, whether or not you know, when you were talking a little bit earlier about recognizing that journalists can have a life, it kind of reminds me of that moment when a seven-year-old sees their teacher in the grocery store for the first <laughs> time, and it's like, Miss Johnson, you drink a seltzer? In my case, they was my students from my <laughs> a happy hour, but you know, similar to hey. <laughs> 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 we go on Friday night, like get out my face. <laughs> students found out you had fun real quick. Um, <laughs> <laughs> but it begs the question, you know, how do you think journalism has changed? You've already like hit on a number of issues, including like whether or not there's room within journalism to engage a, a social justice um, voice and impact. Do you think any of these things are changing? And if so, are they changing in the right direction? Um, I don't think so, really. And that's unfortunate. Like, I guess in terms of... Um, communities being able to, like the, democrat the democratization of um, platforms and like access, like somebody who has a particular, like focus can go and start a newspaper, start a blog, start a, um, a podcast about the issues that are important to them and their community. So to that extent, yes. But when you think about mainstream media, not so much because, you know, the arguments that we're having as journalists about, um, of objectivity about um, like what should be covered, what's worthy of being covered about the audiences that like, are we going after like doing the best coverage for the community that we represent or for the community that's, you know, paying the bills for the publication. All of those conversations have been happening, you know, for 30, 40, 50 years, like talking to, you know, veteran journalists. These were some of the issues that they didn't feel like they had the 
that they were dealing with, but didn't necessarily feel like they had the space to bring up in their newsrooms. And apparently these things like happen in cycles. Um, so, you know, there was a really big push for like diversity in newsrooms, you know, like 10 or 15 years ago, but it's always a reactive response to something, you know, that has happened in the um, political network, <laughs> you know, like, so George Floyd, now there's a, a bigger push for, you know, diverse journalists, you know, after Mike Brown, bigger push for like more diversity in journalism. But it's like, if we as an industry keep responding to crises, um, then how much of it is really um, about like the merit of the work mm -hmm. versus like mm -hmm. a PR move. Mm -hmm. And I think that that is kind of the same um, across the board for mainstream media. Mm. I think you've given everyone a lot to think of here. So in terms of our audience, what do you want to see more people doing with regard to social justice and journalism with regard to how we engage with comedians? What's, what's the, what's the takeaway? What's the marching orders here? Hmm. That's a good question. I think, um, especially when you think about like, um, I'm kind of in a, like as a comedian, but also as like a person who is like deeply cares about and is engaged in like um, social justice work. I find it like, I love the idea of comedians having like a platform to say what they need to say. Um, and or to hold a mirror up to society. But as Mia Co mentioned, we have to think about like which direction we're punching in. So it's like, I'm never a fan of like punching down because it's like, think of yourself as like a creative, you know, there are, there's an easier way or a better way or a funnier way to get your point across without making somebody else like who has less power than you, the butt of your joke. So I would challenge comedians to like, think about the themes in which they want to critique and how they can hold the mirror up to the people in power versus the folks who might be victims of that power structure, that power system. So that would be my marching orders on the com comedic side. Because, you know, we've gotten to, the internet has gotten into a huge debate about, you know, Dave Chappelle's latest special and where people fall on that. Um, so I would challenge people to think about comedy in that sense. And then on the other side, the journalistic side, um, what can we do to create um, newsrooms that are truly like representative of all the communities that we serve instead of um, attempting to write off a community. It's like, oh, they don't read news. They don't pay for news. Like maybe think critically about turning it on yourself. Like why aren't these people, you know, interested in what we have to say as a news organization? Like take your ego out of it. Um, talk to the people who might not pick up a copy of the paper or tune into your channel to figure out like why that audience has tuned you out. I think are very important, you know, ways to be reflective in both the journalistic space and the comedic space. Yeah, thank you for that. Uh, so before we let you go for the evening, we just wanna give you a chance to share your pluggables. How do people find out about People's Report? How do people find out about your standup um, dates? How do folks like and follow and support you? Well, you can find all of um, the People's Report content at PPLS Report Pod across all social platforms. So we're on Facebook, we're on Instagram, we're on Twitter. Um, you can follow me personally um, across platforms at A-M-B-A-W-A-L-K-A, -A -A, which is a play on my name, um, Amba Walker, which is like a homage to my great grandfather. because That's how he used to pronounce my name growing up. So um, there was no E-R, they were all A's. So um, yeah, that's how you can find out about like what I have going on. Yeah, so if you're like a podcast fan, like please check us out. We drop um, every first and 15th, like a check every two weeks. So, you know, our idea is like laughing at the headlines to keep from crying, as I said before. So um, imagine if NPR and The Onion adopted a black baby. That's the People's Report. I love it you said we drop on the first and the 15th, like a check. Um, yes. <laughs> All right. Thank you so much. And we have some additional thanks before we close out for the evening. Of course, we want to thank uh, Mer Meredith King, our wonderful line producer, who just is getting us together, sending the emails, making the Zoom, putting it on calendars, wrangling people. Um, for folks outside of creative spaces, you often don't see line producers, um, but we're all very, very grateful for them and just a bit of kind of inside baseball, BRTW is still like in our spirits doing the electric slide on the National Mall. 
about the fact that we got to a point as a company that we could afford to hire a line producer. So just be happy for us, we're happy for us, and also shout out to Meredith. Um, also, we wanna thank Kira DeCoudre, our wonderful uh, live stream producer. This is the person who is responsible for the very thing that you're watching right now. She's recording, she's letting us know if our lighting is off, if our sound is off, if, if we just sound and look a mess. She's, she's keeping us, together and making sure it's coming to a Facebook and a YouTube near you. Um, we also want to thank Ranchia. Anything that's going on the podcast came through her. Shout out to Ranchia. Shout out to all of the amazing folks that you see on your screen right now, Tim Craig and Mia Kogavia. In addition to being just disrespectfully talented, being amazing writers and amazing actors, they are also directors, they are also producers. Um, and part of their producing work is keeping BRTW running, making sure emails go out and like sending so many emails to people like pretty, pretty, please, please support us, please. It's for the black babies. Um, they are, you know, keeping everything together. Uh, what am I, what am I forgetting y'all? Uh, I want to take this one moment to, first of all, uh, thank all these talented actors again, just like Heather said, and thank you so much, Amber, for your time, your expertise. Uh, we really, really appreciate you, especially spending your, yeah, I guess, in LA, it's like your Sunday going into your your, your evening. So thank you so much. I, I do want to take this moment to uh, let our audience uh, and the participants here uh, know about Writer's Block. We have a lovely writing program uh, that is uh, every uh, other Tuesday. I think the next Writer's Block is October 26. Um, you can check that out on BRTW's website. It's headed by Hade Front. Uh, and if you, your, your, your mama, your sister, your, your, your cousins, uh, your, your, your homies, your friends, your coworkers uh, are interested in creating any kind of writing practice that is a home for you. Um, again, we take you to a certain curriculum between characterization and conflict. Uh, it is uh, one of our outstanding programs that we have at B. B BRTW, and I wanted to make sure that everyone is aware of that. So even if you're interested in writing satire, uh, like Amber does, um, it is a space for you. Thank you so much. Thank you so much, Tim, for bringing that up. Yeah, you can find out about Writer's Block on thebrtw.org. Writer's Block, Melanated Mondays, and Revolution Now are all featured prominently on the homepage. You don't even have to go to the menu and you know try and guess where it is. It's right there for you. Um, and also thank you for bringing up Haide Souffrant because in addition to facilitating writer's block and showing up with that, that masters of creative writing and just giving away the information for free. That's really what writer's block is. It is a safe space for black writers that is led by and curated for the needs of black writers with the technical information, but also the time and support to dedicate to your writing craft. So by all means, join you don't have to be at a certain level to participate um, but in addition to doing that Haide also facilitated the um, community section of our agenda this evening so shout out to Haide for that and Haide of course also helps us with programs and operations so Haide is a very busy bee in BRTW and we're very grateful to have her and with that those are all of our uh end of the evening updates. Everyone have a wonderful evening and a special thanks to everyone who was able to join us tonight.